It's never easy, as I say all the time. And you've heard me say it before. It always seems when the pressure's on, more pressure comes. It's the way it is. But Emmanuel, God is with us. And we just did a beautiful concert last week. It was an awesome weekend. It was over almost 90 people here for the service, well over 100 for the concert. Amen. Praise God and thank you for your hard work. It paid off. People got the message. It was not just a concert. Anybody was here? It was not just music. It was a story of Christ. You watched it. Amen for Ben and our, and our, 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 our people back there doing what they do. We're all a family. We're all one part of it. Amen. It was a production. It was a production. It was. Very well put. Um, so being how it's Christmas Eve, I didn't think I would want to do the same thing again, but when the Lord, when I found out at 5.30 last night that I was going to have to preach, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm sitting in Boston trying to figure out how I'm going to get home first on Christmas Eve. <laughs> and also, what I'm going to talk about. And I couldn't go to bed last night until the Lord gave me something. I said, you know what? It's Christmas, as people in the world are looking at. But let's talk about Emmanuel. Let's talk about Christ. Because he's always been with us. But too many times you look at him as just a little baby in a manger. And that's such a, it's a big part, but it's one part, as we were learning in our Sabbath school lesson this morning. There's many parts to the judgment. There's many parts to how God tries to reveal himself. And the reason this chart is up here is because at some point, I'm not going to this today. I just want to have it as a prop. Um, this is 1844, just so you know ahead of time. This is the end. In other words, the second coming, as we talked about this morning. In the middle, you have the close of probation and the Sunday law. And all these things are lined up with facts about biblical facts, of course, all from the Bible. And <clears throat> it's, been on my, it's been a burden, and I haven't been able to get to it. And I've had many requests to do a Daniel Revelation study or basically a Daniel study. And with all of our new people, I'm going to do that with God's grace in the beginning of the year. Um, we're going to do it for an hour in the afternoon on Sabbath. And hopefully I can get some of the young or newer baptized members here because we baptize them and they went through baptismal studies with the fundamentals of the church. Unfortunately, some of them have never gotten Daniel, so they don't know where we're basing it on. So today I thought I'd talk about Daniel because um, Mrs. White writes it this way, and I've read this before. She calls our attention to study and to study the book of Daniel. And what we study in our Sabbath school, especially today and throughout this quarter, uh, this kind of proves the point. Here's where the quote starts. As we near the close of the world's history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time in which we are living. Amen. This was given for us. This is about our time in the period of history, which is where everything comes together. Maybe that's why she said it, right? So Daniel is a great place to start. And Daniel is in here, believe me, all through it, along with a lot of other scripture and spirit of prophecy. See, Daniel 2, so what I'd like to do today is go over a, a whole picture of Daniel and the importance of just the book of Daniel and all the preachings that could come out of it. Just like this here, we could preach till the Lord comes. You can preach on Daniel till the Lord comes. Everything we stand on is in Daniel. It's not just in Daniel. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But I'm going to go through some of the highlights of all the sermons that could come out of Daniel. You see, because Daniel is a treasure trove of expository preaching on so many things. Um, for instance, the preaching on the meaning of a text. The prophecies of Daniel give us that. Name our chapters that are so much lined up with each other. 2, 7, and 8 through 12. Hebrew is written in, what do you call that? Poetry. That's why it's called the poetic, poetic language. It doesn't mean what we think in America, where things rhyme. 
But these chapters I just read all give a parallel story, and each of them sometimes add a little more to the picture. So God gives us the overview, and Daniel does it so well. So 2, 7, 8 to 12 are rich in material that explains God's sovereignty and history and his plan of salvation in the sanctuary ritual. Okay, a lot of us have heard that. All I'm saying is we can do a lot of preaching on just this stuff. We move on, and his plan of salvation in the sanctuary ritual, as I just said, we can go to chapters more specifically 8 and 9. The historical chapters are 1 through 6, provide stories whose practical lessons can be applied to um, the lives of listeners. So, Daniel 2 provides an outline of world history from the time of Babylon to the second coming. Now, Babylon is obviously way back here, okay? But it is the groundwork for setting up us to 1844 with the 2300 day prophecy and all the prophecies that are built into that. Daniel 7 builds on chapter 2. It gives you a parallel story, what's going on too, but it adds a little bit more each time it goes. God's so generous with us. Give us little pits at a time, right, Yvonne? Just like when you teach the little children. Do you dump the whole thing on them? You try to bring them along as they interpret and understand it. But it adds important player to the stage of history, the little horn, which is a symbol of a certain beast that comes up out of the water, also known as the papacy. Apart from explaining the symbols for various nations in history, which is also there, right? What are they? Babylon? Media, Persia, Greece, Greece, and Rome in two parts, right? Okay, Daniel 2 also has important lessons and points for a good sermon as well. You could just preach one on that. God is in control of history. That's another point you could preach on. And we probably have, we've done it here before. There is also showing us the power in united prayer, which we have a good prayer ministry here. Every time after, after the worship time, there's a pe- group of people that meet here. Also, in three, history is indeed his story. Amen. Amen. The right reading of history brings the assurance that he who controls the cosmos also guides the storm Amen. or the atom, right down to the atom. Four, the historical fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel 2 confirms the inspiration of the Bible, which could be a sermon on its own. I was talking to, I said this before, I was talking to one of my daughters. People get them confused. They know Sarah, but Elizabeth, who was here for the concert with my youngest grandson, and she's college educated, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Unfortunately, college does not teach religion the way we would teach it. They lump them all together in a big barrel and say they're all even. They're all equal. And we know they're not. Okay? I don't argue with her about Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, or any of that. I narrowed her down to say, look, we're only going to talk about my religion or Christianity in general because all Christian churches believe, or so they say, in this book. So I don't get in bashing other denominations of religion. I do, however, get into what this Bible says and what Christianity says. So we go round and round quite often. Little by little, I'm chipping away. She told me that this is a fake book. It's just a book. And that I can't prove certain things with just that book. I can't prove science, so she says. Yeah, and I can't prove history. History's been proven. His story's been told. Amen. Most of the stuff has happened. Guys, we're right up to here, and this is sometime in our time. Not happened yet. This is 1844, and then we go backwards. All the history's been, it's in history books. It's proven, the Bible, to be correct. Okay, so if that's correct, I'm going to go with maybe the rest of it is. So I, I nailed her on that one, and then we talked about science, which we never got to. But I was going to talk to her about some of the other stuff the Bible has to say about science and how it's been proven correct by true science. I have to add true science. <clears throat> some of the lessons of Daniel 7 are prophecy is the foundation of our faith. And we're told if we look in, you know, you guys know, um, let's go to 2 Peter just for, just to show you that I'm not just pulling this out of my hat, okay? 
You know the verse before I go there, but I'm going to go there to make sure we read it right out of the Bible, okay? Second Peter. What is it? 1, 19. There you go. You want to recite it? I can't do that, but I can read it. We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. We don't have to go very far. I said there's other scripture, but let's keep going with just Daniel. Two, the fact that Daniel 7 largely repeats Daniel 2, remember I said about the parallel, indicates that God sees this message as very important for his people. When God says something's important, we ought to perk our ears up, right? Especially since we happen to be living in the time it's been talking about. Praise God. Three, the pre-advent judgment. What was that, Brother Gary? What's that called? The pre-advent judgment that begins in 1844 is the first phase of the final judgment right out of our Sabbath school. First phase. So 1844 is right here. It starts a whole new chapter, doesn't it? Then we can break it down with 1888, 1960, uh, 1961, and today. And it, as you go down the chart, you hit all these other facts that are going on here. So I'm going to give you a little explanation on how to read it. Yes? So as you go down, you, 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 as God does, you nail down more intricate details for that section of time. So once you get to this part, you go down. These things are happening. Notice they happen across all three segments. Okay? Um, as we go down further, we see that they narrow down to a more specific time period. And, and, and as Adventists, as Christians, we understand these words. We hear things like the three angels' message swells. We see that the early rain, and by the chart you can see it swells to a point where it explodes. Okay? So as you go down the chart, you get more and more clear understanding, just like with Daniel as he goes through the chapters. <clears throat> Yet no amount of intellectual understanding of these prophecies will benefit us unless we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Amen. That's why the colleges can't teach religion. Especially when they're forced not to, which is ironic because colleges were based on religion in the beginning. Yet they will not give credit where credit is due. <clears throat> A sermon would indicate that other phases, the judgment during the millennium, talked about that this morning, Revelation 20, verse 4, and at the end of the millennium, 20, again, verse 11 to 15. You know those verses, right? What's the big, what is it? The great white throne was set. A whole judgment scene is given. Okay? <clears throat> in the vision in Daniel 8 is the climactic conclusion of the symbolic presentation in the book. And what follows in 8.15 to the end of the book is supplementary to the vision of chapter 8. People say that's your interpretation. Folks, we have some solid truth here that the Bible doesn't leave us room to interpret. The Bible interprets itself. People are not taught that. They're told that that's your interpretation. And the first thing out of their mouths is that, that's why there's so many churches. They interpret it this way, and you say, who's right? And I say, look, the Bible interprets it. If, if it doesn't interpret it, it's speculation on my part, too. But where we have solid ground, let's go with it. If you can get them to sit long enough. The message, it, you know what? Let the Holy Spirit work with them. Just because they don't sit down with you in one or two days. Sometimes it may be a month or two before you get back to that person, or the Holy Spirit leads it to someone else. And they'll say, oh, I was talking to somebody. I don't remember their name, but they, um, yes? Food is a great way. It's up together, right? <laughs> 
Sure. You know what? Jesus. Well, I said to myself then, I said, well, their blood is no longer on my hands. Because I told them, but they will not listen. Well, they can't listen. Well, like I said, maybe not this time, but maybe next time. Father, forgive them for they don't know what to do, and we keep continuing to pray for them. The Holy Spirit is going to hit when it's time. We just It's not our job. We're just to give the word from truth. Amen, brother. The message of Daniel 8 is a pre-advent judgment illustrated in the Old Testament by what? Anybody want to venture a guess? We talked about Sabbath school. The pre-advent judgment is illustrated in the Old Testament by what? We have it. Nobody else has it. Sanctuary. sanctuary, exactly. The sanctuary service is a prophecy, type, anti-type, of showing us that another way that God shows us, just through the sanctuary message, this stuff is happening. And why? A sermon on this topic would explain the Old Testament sanctuary service and how this explains the pre-advent judgment beginning when? Come on, the whole day. October? 22nd, 1844. We weren't Seventh-day Adventists back then. So when people say we failed, I'm saying, well, we weren't even in existence until, I don't know, 12 years later, <laughs> before we became a denomination. This was Methodists and everybody else came out. God was, God always tries to reach what he has. He's long-suffering. He always tries to reach what he has. Did he not try to reach Israel? Did he give him a long probation? Yes. Before he started the apostolic church. He did the same thing in 1844. They weren't hearing it. So he had no choice but to take it to another group of people. Or start up another group of people. Such as Seventh-day Adventists. Other groups came up out of that time though. Um, but Seventh-day Adventists have a special place. And I don't see in scripture anywhere where there's another group coming out of this one Amen. as a worldwide movement I should say the fulfillment of the 70 week prophecy in Daniel 9 is another faith strengthening prophecy it was one of those prophecies that's part of the 2300 days that gets us to 1844 and the Bible tells us where to start it too you got to dig a little bit but it's not um, hard to find but beyond that, this chapter reveals Daniel as a man of prayer. First thing, see, they named that first. Very important. We can't do anything without prayer. We can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. I can't stand here. I can't talk. I'm a man of foolishness by myself. An example to be intimidated by all ministers and lay members. Not intimidated. Yeah, it says intimidated. Example to be intimated. Excuse me. Imitate, no, imitate, excuse me, <clears throat> by all, not just some, and not just ministers, lay people as well. We're all accountable, right? We're all, how is it said, we are all high priests? We are a generation? Neither his work as a statesman nor the good life at the luxuri luxurious Babylonian court could distract him from his daily communion with God. Who am I talking about? Daniel. And his three friends, I might add. Daniel 9, 24-27 is a sermon on the Messiah. The time of his appearing, his life and work, and his death. We're going to leave it there, but we know it doesn't stop at his death, does it? Because he has been resurrected. It gives us hope. Yet no amount of intellectual understanding of this prophecy will benefit us unless we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. It won't benefit us a thing without Jesus. This salvation, according to the New Testament, is offered freely to all humanity. Such a salvation, however, cannot be purchased. It can only be experienced through the surrender of oneself to Jesus. All elements of a sermon on this topic. This is just one other topic within here. We could preach for, what, at least 52 Sabbaths, right, Gary? On Daniel. And still not, every one of us could preach a topic for 52 weeks. 
and not get it all. God is omnipotent. Daniel 10 introduces the last vision of Daniel 11 through 12, but it contains the most important text for a sermon on the great controversy. Just like the book. We've got to get the books out there. I'm guilty. I've got to get them out of the shed and get some more in the building. They go as fast as they bring them in, and that's good. On the great controversy. No other text in Scripture describes more clearly the struggle between the invisible powers that controlled and influenced nations than verse 13 of Revelation 10. Daniel 10 reveals the that a human being has the freedom to oppose God. Remember we talked about that in Sabbath school this morning? When we were talking about the justification of, of the judgments, how God is justified? And a sermon on this resurrection will include Daniel 12, 2, one of two clear texts in the Old Testament on the resurrection. And Daniel's got it all. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not picking on Daniel, but yes, I am, because there's so much in it. But you can go to Psalms, you can go to Hebrews, you can go to Revelation, and these will all give you just as many. You can go to Leviticus and just talk about the feast days and the sanctuary. There's a lot of things going on in that area in the world today. How about the historical chapters? The story, stories in the historical chapters 1 through 6 are full of life's lessons. And in chapter 1, we learned that the tests of character are opportunities to grow. Sometimes we look at those trials. I don't like the trials. I don't know about you guys. But I realize they're there for a purpose. Like coming home last night, running kind of late. Trees were down, and they, I was on some dark roads in Lebanon. Um, someone just threw some cones out there. And I could have slammed on the brakes and missed it, but I decided to drive over the cone. Big mistake. I got five miles down the road, and my radiator's leaking, and I'm stuck. Whoa. Praise God, I was stuck in front of one of my friend's house, or a, a side street at one of my friend's house. So I parked it in his yard. He gave me a ride home. God knows that. You know what? It's amazing. I didn't get up tight. I was a little bit, st- I was mad at myself for not actually stopping and just saying, I'm going to drive over the cone. Instead of slamming on my brakes, my mistake now it might cost me. Chili, it's not here today. He just replaced the radiator in that vehicle like a year ago. So, I mean, Chili, you know how to do it. You just you did it last year. You might have to do it again. Okay. In chapter one, we learned that tests of character are opportunities for growth. I mean, if I can't deal with just that, you may have not notice about me, but I'm a rockhead. I'm really granite. You know that? <laughs> well, my wife would be here. She would agree. Um, maybe that's why I'm still driving a truck and I can't stop. I'd like to, and maybe next year I'll quit. Maybe that will be the year, but patience. <laughs> Being at everybody's bidding, let's put it that way. Everybody wants to pick on the truck driver. Some truck drivers should be picked on. That's why I'm not a truck driver, Anita. I drive a truck. I have friends who are truck drivers. I don't want to be one of them, but I do drive a truck. <clears throat> but we must stand up for what we believe in. And that doesn't always mean standing up and telling somebody something or saying some words. Sometimes it just means the way you act, the way you live. Like the sign I saw in one church, preach a sermon every day and sometimes speak it in words. People are watching. Those people, there's somebody at that table, James, who is watching you, and the words went in, and the Holy Spirit is going to nurture them, and mark my words, someone's going to be getting in contact with you or somewhere along the line to want to know more. And I hope you have a book or something to give to them or a track. <clears throat> Christians must stand up for what they believe in. Chapter 3, we see that through, throughout history, God's children have always received grace in times of need. Hebrews 4.16 and that there is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly concentrated, consecrated to God. That's hard to do. I was, who was I talking to? Just Oh, our buddy Rick Price. We were having a conversation on uh, selflessness and selflessness. And he was saying the only reason... We should love somebody as if we get something like a quick, uh, what, quick pro quo. 
something for something? And I said, well, that may be the blessing and the reward from God, but that shouldn't be why we serve as him, to see what he can give us. I'm hoping I get to the point where I can love God just because he loved me. And you can say that's a give and a take, and I guess it is. But I'm not giving my love to him just because I want to stay healthy, just because I want to go to heaven, just because I want to live in a mansion. I hope that's not my motivation. That's just a nice thing from, because God is good. But that shouldn't be my motivation to help out Eduardo over here when he needs help. Because, you know, I can call him up next week and have him help me out. Because I helped you. Don't do it that for that reason. So God's children have always received grace. And that's what we can learn from Daniel. There is no limit to the usefulness of one who, putting self aside, makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit. That's how we empty our cup. That's how we prepare for this time right here. What is that time? Remember I told you? Actually, Sunday law. The test. That's this period right here. All this stuff goes on here. National Sunday Law, focal point of the ages. Are we praising God because we live in the focal point of the ages? Maybe it's a little bit scary to learn what we have to do because all the stuff we have to do, look at all the stuff that happens here. Loud cry, repeating of the three angels' messages and the power of the fourth. The latter rain. The early rain. Let me ask you, is there any difference between the rain? Is it the rain or is it the time of the rain? The time of the rain. The rain that hauls in the springtime, Jerry was here, the rain that goes on your garden in the springtime helps the plants to grow. When I plant my fall crop, that latter rain that's harvesting is also feeding my plants that are starting, like you know some of my Brussels sprouts or some of the later stuff that I'm planting. Okay? They started over here. They all have, but they get bigger over here. The rain is still the same, and the early rain is still happening over here. Some people are still getting early rain. Their seeds are being nourished. The Sabbath proclamation more fully. The great shaking. The judgment of the righteous living. The final eternal seal. And then it goes down and breaks on me. The seal of God and the mark of the beast happening at the same time. We talked about that in Sabbath school this morning. We see the time of trouble starts here. Goes right through. But you notice it's thin when it starts over here. It's thicker when it ends. Because it's after the close of probation. Satan's loud cry. You guys ever hear about that one? Satan's loud cry. So all these things are happening on here. And it talks about the marvelous working of Satan in there. Satan personating Christ. All comes from Daniel and other places. But the bedrock for it is Daniel. In chapter 4, we discover that God's judgment may be averted by repentance and conversion. We should never despair of the conversion of anyone. Those people at your table, not their time yet. We're still here. They got time. The danger is us. We're the ones that got to be ready to seal here, otherwise we'll be shaken out. Did you ever think about that? We've been given a lot. All right, so some of us... I don't know, I date myself. I was born before 1961. That just happens to be a date on there. Some of you may be after. Some of you may be before and earlier. In chapter 5, we find that sin does not go unpunished. Again, Sabbath school this morning. And we see how prone we are to forget the lessons of the past. Chapter 6 teaches us that a a consistent refusal to do evil will bring Christians into situations similar to the lion's den. It's not going to go on scene. This guy over here, I hate to call him anything, Lucifer, the fallen angel, he ain't going to just let you walk away. It doesn't happen like that. But we can grow through it and have protection to be ready to be sealed. Amen. Thank you. Mm. Daniel's experience in chapter 6 is a reminder that a governmental decree, decree in the future will require all mankind to worship the beast in his image, just like in Revelation 13. <clears throat> but it prepares us to withstand it. Thank God he doesn't just throw that on us right now. But remember, the, <laughs> the slyness of the fallen one, he's probably not going to come in on you just like he did last time. 
you know, back in the 1900 time when they put the Sunday law, Bloom laws on the books. He's probably going to come, because those books, those laws are still there, by the way. And just maybe that was the first planting of dependence in front of Jerusalem. You know those banners? They were planted back then. We were on grace for a long time before we were born. Okay? So people that say, to, you know, we got plenty of time to move into the country, well, maybe we do, maybe we don't. I'm not saying we do or don't. But if I go with the parallelism of the desolation of the t- Jerusalem and the, ben- the pan- banners were planted then, and if we re- apply that to the banners being planted as the Sunday law already on the books, and you know what? I did a, I did a reading of that, and, and the book, um, the books that were written back in 1900, they haven't changed the verbiage at, verbiage at all. You would think they would. They pushed it forward, and they're trying to make it harder, but they're using the same exact words. Word for word. I didn't even think of anything new. But I think they're going to come in a little more slyly or a little bit more deceptively. Maybe through something called climate change. Okay? We already know that those things are working. We can't be fooled. We have to be the people on the edge of the sword knowing this, being able to talk it and teach it. By the way, the man who owns this chart, even though we're trying to get some more made and Gary has one, this is Frank um, Vesquez. Um, huh? Frankie, he's head of community services. I talked to him this week. He wants to take this thing country, uh, conference-wide. He told me he wants to get these in. We'll get them made. He says, I will sell them. We'll make a few bucks on them. Not much to, to support the ministry. He, he's in love with that. There's not many people we ran into. We have a bunch of them here in this church, though. How about the themes in Daniel? Jesus is the center of this book. I might say he's the beginning, the center, and the end. One, he is the stone in chapter 2. Two, he is the man in the fiery oven in chapter 3. Three, he is the son of man in chapter 7. Four, he is the prince of hosts in chapter 8. Five, he is the Messiah, the prince, excuse me, in chapter 9. And then he's six, six, number six. He's the, uh, he is Michael in the last vision of chapters 10 and 12. Do you know what Daniel means? The word Daniel, the name, anybody? Who said that, Denova? Oh, yep, exactly. God is my judge. And throughout the book, we find explanations of that truth. Explanations that God is the judge. And the whole judgment focus of the ages, which our Sabbath school lesson was so wonderful this morning. Yep, throughout the book we find explanations of that truth. The book begins and ends with references to judgment. At the beginning, apostate Judah is judged, Daniel 1, 1 and 2. And at the end, the king of the north in chapter 11, 40 through 45. And in the middle of the book, chapter 7, 9 to 14, the ancient of days chairs of judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15. In which... In the presence of a multitude of angels, books are open, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. The scripture reading out of Revelation was what? It was the beginning of that. Who could open up the scroll and break the seal? Who was worthy? So that's right in the middle. Where the ancient days chairs a judgment, in which in the presence of a multitude of angels... Books are open. I might add there's more than just angels there. There's the 24 elders, which we're not going to talk about today, but there are a lot of beings there, including during one portion of judgment, hopefully all of us. Ancient days, chairs a judgment in which in the presence of a multitude of angels, books are open, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. We've got nothing to fear, Except for fear, maybe. On each side of this great judgment scene, we find further references to judgment. Going to either side of Daniel 7, I'm talking about. So beginning of side. On either side, 
the great judgment scene. We find further reference to the judgment, and in chapter 4, we see Nebuchadnezzar, the proud king of Babylon, is judged and reduced to animal status. We all know that story, right? How many years did he run around in a while? Seven. Seven. Complete number, right? And in chapter 5, his grandson, great king Belshazzar, what happened to him? Mm hmm exactly. 527, right? There is no shortage of material for a sermon on God's, God's judgment. Yet in this day and age, we refuse to, nah, I can say we, but largely as a community of Christians, it's not preached. What's being preached? Just love everybody? Which is funny because in the apostolic church, they preach what? They preach law, which is love, but they were preaching as, you got to do this, you got to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. When they were supposed to be preaching and showing the love of the sanctuary message and the love of God. Now we come to the time where we're supposed to be talking about judgment and we want to talk about love. They're synonymous, or at least they should be, but nobody likes to be judged. Anybody been to court? You like to go before the judge? Anybody? I don't really mind. I don't respect them. I'm sorry to say. It's on YouTube. <laughs> respect has to be earned. That's right. And when they're not following their own laws, then I don't respect them. Right. <clears throat> I don't call them names. I don't go up and slap them around or nothing like that. But I just am a little bit reluctant. I'm not shaking in my boots. Maybe truck driving has taught me that. I faced so many law enforcement officers, and I've been to court so many times for stupid or foolish things. But nevertheless, I go and I pay them their homage. <clears throat> but I don't respect them. I lost my place for a minute. No shortage of sermons on judgments, but we very rarely hear them. But I think it should be peppered with love. I think this chart shows that all the ways. God is trying to reach them. Are all him showing love? How about patience? How about mercy? Are they not in here? He goes to great extent. We, we, Gary, didn't we learn in our Sabbath school? Right? The final executive judgment. What was that about? Making sure everybody, God took everybody through the channels to make sure they understood everything about God. He was trying to educate those who were judging as much as the rest. Or more, I should say. On more of his love. He doesn't stop loving. The problem with me is I do. Or I don't know somebody and I'm like, yeah, they deserve what they get, kind of creeps in. I'm like, no, what? That's not, that's not godlike. I don't have to agree with what they did, but I shouldn't look down upon them. Like I'm looking down on you, Ron. I'm, I always do. I'm only saying because I'm higher up. I'm standing, you're sitting. <laughs> okay, vindication. The historical chapters of the book, chapters 1 through 6, illustrate how God vindicates and delivers those who remain faithful to him in a hostile pagan environment. Has anybody noticed that their environment is changing a little bit? Kenton talked about <laughs> religious liberty. Man, they're yanking that rug right off from underneath us. And we're in America, the last country standing, and we're on shaky ground, I hate to say. Why? Because prophecy told me we're on shaky ground. We have a beast from the water and a beast from the earth. The beast from the earth is who? It's a lamb-like beast that speaks like a dragon. That indicates a change. That indicates the country we're in, and since we've been around for almost 250 years, and we're now up in this area, I got a feeling the lamb-like beast is speaking as a dragon. Huh? <laughs> and that beast is... Actually, he is a composite beast, isn't he? <laughs> GMO beast. Um, go online, I can send you a video of... Amazingly, it's, it's just amazing how much this is so true. Has anybody seen what's on the um, courtyard of the UN? I'll send it to you. Huh? You saw that composite beast, didn't you? 
It looks just like the, just like what Bible talks about the composite beast in Revelation. Just like it. And they got it up there. It's very colorful. It's, it's huge. It's right in the courtyard. They're proud of it. Wow. And someone's going to tell me the Bible don't know what it's talking about? We can prove it now in history beyond what we thought we could believe. God vindicates and delivers those who remain faithful to him in a hostile pagan environment. Those, the, <clears throat> these chapters contain the motive of trial and troubling and trouble ending in evelation and glory. Did that make sense to you? Sometimes I read them, it don't make sense to me. These chapters contain the motive of trial and trouble ending in evelation and glory. I guess I could say evaluation. Does that sound better? Elevation. Elevation. Mm-hmm. Yep. In glory. Thus, the new and good news that trials and temptations are followed by blessings for those obedient to God in proclamation throughout these chapters. Sabbath school lesson. <clears throat> for example, in chapter 1, the four young Hebrews are tested concerning their commitment to the law of God. They are found faithful and are promoted to the palace of the king. That's in 119. In chapter 3, Daniel's friends are tested again and found to be faithful. God delivers them, and instead of being burned alive, they prosper as a result of further promotion by the king. 3.30. In chapter 6, Daniel is falsely accused and condemned to death. However, the consp uh, conspiracy of the king's counselors fails, and the prophet experiences deliverance from the lion's den. As a result, Daniel prospered. 6.28. See, preaching from Daniel can be a life-changing experience. I see why Mrs. White wrote, we need to study it more time, more in our time than any other time. Amen. Because it applies so directly to us. And there's so many sermons in there. Don't wait for one of us to get up here and preach it. You know, when we're preparing these things, we get schooled. You know? I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I was trying to keep it... Simple, but Emmanuel, God is with us. Do we really believe God is with us? Amen. Are we at that point, or do we have to get closer to the fiery furnace here? And then if we end up going past this after the ceiling, this is not going to be a pleasure trip. The plagues. The plagues actually start in here. Well, some of the parts of the plagues, but the plagues start right here. Do you know when the death decree happens, just for a little update? The death decree will happen to after the second. When there's no purpose for it. That's why Mrs. White writes in Desire of Ages, nobody dies from that death decree. But God holds them accountable because if he had given them time, they would have killed. That doesn't mean there won't be martyrs throughout history. We already know that. But it's right here where the death decree becomes the most severe. That's after we're sealed. We're not going to be touched. Praise God. But we have a work to do to get this part here to happen, this National Sunday Law in the United States becoming enforced, the law is already there, becoming enforced, isn't going to happen until we get our characters right, until we go on our knees and realize we're living in the Day of Atonement from this point right here. But from this point, it becomes serious because those of us who are alive are judged. If we were dead, we'd be in here, right here. He's waiting for us to be ready to go here. That's how good God is. So we're sealed and we can go forth in his power and finish the work. He's waiting for us. Mrs. White writes, we will be amazed how quick the work is finished once we let Christ take the reins. When he has the reins, what does that mean? They're steering you. They're controlling you. You're giving yourself to him to do it. Then it happens, and this stuff gets finished rapidly. Rapidly. I've had some Adventist old-timers tell me, you know, a couple weeks. It ain't going to be a couple weeks. Okay? I'm not going to tell you, but I think it's more like several years in this zone right here. Several years. <clears throat> I'd like it to be shorter. Maybe looking at back with eternity here 
and here on both ends, three years is going to seem like a drop in the bucket. But when you're going through it, it don't seem that it don't it seems like it's dragging out. Just some food for thought. Yes. Um, he does because of our hard heartedness. He prefers that we would do it when we have time. He prefers that we do it in our good times. But if we look in the history of everything else that's happened before us in the Bible, when does it grow the most under persecution? You know why? Because none of us are here rich that I know of. Maybe you are. I'm not trying to pick on you. I'm not. Maybe some of you are wealthy. I don't think so. I'm not trying to put anybody down. Um, huh? Well, in that way, we're wealthy, but I'm talking about in, in, in world, in the world, you know, monetarily. You know, does anybody have a big bank account that can write me a check for a mill? How about 500 grand? I'll settle. I'll, 250. 50. <laughs> What's my point? We have a lot to lose here in America. When you go on a mission trip, they ain't got nothing. They're lucky if they got any money in there at all, right? It's hard to lose what you worked hard for. You don't want to give it up that easy. Yet, in holding on to it, folks, we're going to lose it. Believe me, this great reset that they're talking about with this monetary money that they want to do away with us having money. You know, I don't want to be like the steward who buries it in the ground and says, Lord, you gave me 10 grand, here's the 10 grand back. He's like, what did you do with it? Did you buy tracks? Did you buy great controversy? Did you fund a cooking school? Did you do whatever? Did you give somebody, a widow, or someone who lost her husband? By the way, we have a couple families to deal with down in the middle of Rockville that we have to get back to. So preaching from Daniel can be a life-changing experience, even if you have no other book. <clears throat> For the preacher and the listeners, whether you preach from its prophetic, biographical, Historical, judgmental, it doesn't matter which area you go to. There's more than enough there. Look at it. That's why Mrs. Wright wrote, wrote it this way. Patriarchs and kings. As we near the close of this history, the prophecies recorded by Daniel demand our special attention as they relate to the very time in which we are living. Can't say it any better. So don't laugh about, oh, I heard that before. I've heard a lot of this before. I don't know, Brother Gary, Kenton, anybody else? Uh, Anita, Yvonne, you guys have this? You have all these things memorized? I don't even come close. I can't remember scripture. I got to look it up. And after you start saying it, you go, oh, yeah, I remember now. I, I marvel at these people that were in the Christian faith that could recite chapter and verse, like Noah Webster. Huh? I think, I think my brain is a little too old, really. Um, or like Kenton, knowing all the hymns. I marvel at that. I wish I did. Maybe if I was an Adventist my whole life, I would. I don't know. Started off late in life. I don't know. I know when I hear it, I know it's correct. I know what it is. I can't go to it. But that's why this chart is so important. Um, we hope to have some more made, and um, we hope to start teaching from this. Or preaching from it, either way. Okay, so we're working toward it. God is working with us. It's like when we were doing martial arts. All the kids want to be black belts, and the instructor will go, you got anybody want to be a black belt? All oh, the kids, everybody was, yeah. He goes, yep, not today, not tomorrow, but someday. <laughs> Same thing with us. We're not, I, I won't judge you. I'm not ready today. I wish I was. But I know I'll be ready someday soon. At least I pray. So please pray for the Jerry and his family because he's not here today, but he'll be back with his message um, next quarter. And um, we're singing his hymns that he picked. I didn't change them. Just changes the uh, scripture reading. I almost used his too as three angels. It would fit. But I decided to bring it a little more closer to God's with us. And how he's been with us since the garden, he's never stopped. And I think we focus on him as a child. And it's fine, that's one point. He, he stepped down to be that child. We don't realize what he gave up just to be the child. 
when we're talking about God and Jesus. But I love your story on, on, on the, uh, the concert. I thought it was very well done. You had a little bit historic, very factual up there. You had the story, and, and, and the people that were involved did a great job. And um, I just pray for those who came out of the 105, and they were witness to, and that they'll come back and visit us.